Today, I am thrilled to have Scott Dickers with me, founder of the renowned humor site, The Onion. Scott is a New York Times bestselling author and Amazon bestselling author in humor. He's won a Peabody Award, a Ferber Prize, over 30 Webby Awards, and that's just scratching the surface of his achievements. I particularly love his How to Write Funny series. It's so practical, and there's so many really helpful, insightful frameworks when it comes to putting humor on the page. So I'm really excited to dig into that today. But before we do, Scott, is there anything else you'd love people to know about you and your connections to comedy? Boy, uh, and those are definitely the highlights. Um, but, you know, I, I've been doing comedy my whole life and mm. I'm an old man now, so I've done everything. I, I continue and have always done some sort of performing like stand up or acting or voice acting professionally. Um, I do a ton of different kinds of writing and, um, I mentor people in comedy and, you know, if you name the medium, I've done it. Like I, mm. I do a lot of street comedy, which is like unsuspected, you know, stunts and things that are, uh, just happen on the street. Um, I've done, I've made a couple of movies, worked on other movies, written movies, sold and written TV pilots and wrote on shows. Um, and it's just a, it's a long, <laughs> I had an animation company, made a lot of short animated uh, cartoons. So yeah, it's a rather long and exhaustive list of things. And people often just see the highlights and figure, oh, you did that. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, tip of the iceberg. Yeah. I understand that. And this may be uh, interconnected because actually the first thing I wanted to ask you about before I dig into a few craft things is lots of people want to be writers and comedy writers, um, but few people actually build like brands of the size that you have successfully. And so it's like an even smaller sh pool of people who've been able to do that. So I wonder when you think about that, what are some of the differentiating factors that have meant that you've been able to do that as well as like the, the huge writing project you've just yeah. described? <clears throat> that reminds me of another thing that I've done that I didn't mention, which is I drew comic strips and I had a couple of comic strips that ran for a long time. One ran for 10 years and um, that was actually what kind of got me my start in comedy. And that's what led to me being involved with The Onion. Mm. And it was a very successful comic strip brand. So it was like another brand that I created. And so I already had some experience creating brands when I had done, when I was doing the onion and the differentiation, I guess I would say is the stick to mm. You know, it's the people who pick something and then stick with it when it's working, like when there's traction, there are plenty of people who pick something and stick to it, but there's really no traction. The audience is not really liking it or catching on to it. And those people kind of spin their wheels for a long time. Then there's people who, who have something that's really good that people like that has a lot of potential, but they don't stick with it. So the real magic ingredient is something people like and you stick with it. Mm. So doing a comic strip, you're automatically stuck because you have to produce a comic strip every day and put it in the newspaper. With The Onion, <clears throat> the weekly print deadline was built in at first. So we had to produce an issue and we had to put it out. And when something is consistent and people like it, the brand builds itself. You know, it's like you put in all the prebiotic prebiotic. And so the, um, the beautiful flora will grow. Mm. Yeah. I love that. And easier said than done, I think, which is again, why I love, um, in your series that you, you really kind of hone in on what's going to make things reliable and repeatable as well, because yes. um, obviously there's all kinds of creatives and sometimes that kind of talk um, is not the kind that people want to engage with, but that's what I really love if you want to be a pro. So when you do think about um, not just on a brand level, but on a craft level, being able to produce like reliable, repeatable quality, what are some of the things that come top of mind for you? Yeah, that's a good question because a lot of the sort of best practices are definitely in the books. Yeah. There are some sort of like ephemeral things that maybe it would be better to talk about here. And I touch on it in the book, but it's not listed as like one of the steps. 
-hmm. And that is, it really should be fun. It should be Mm. something that you really enjoy. I do see a lot of people getting into comedy who are kind of pure ambition and they have a goal in mind. I want to get to point B and I'm going to do X, Y, and Z to get there. But they're, they're lacking the joy and it's really more like, I don't know, the kind of ambition that you might see in someone who's building ball bearings as opposed to launching mm-hmm. a comedy career. And the audience can smell that. They, mm-hmm. they know when someone's having fun and really enjoying the process. And there's no connection, there's no correlation between the amount of fun you're having and how good it is. So you Mm. could be having the most fun in the world and be producing terrible work that nobody likes. That doesn't matter because typically when someone's starting out, that's where they are. They're enjoying themselves. They're loving it. This is what most of us did as kids, you know, Mm. but nobody really thinks it's funny. The best you're going to get is grandma saying, oh, that's really good, you know, so lies from loved ones are going to buoy you with this false... uh, confidence for a little while, at least until you encounter your first actual neutral feedback, Mm. you know, from maybe a paying audience or, or just an uninterested audience. And so, you know, we all know about Malcolm Gladwell's, uh, 10,000 hours theory. And I, I think about that and talk about that a lot, that a lot of times when someone comes on the comedy scene, who's new, who everyone recognizes as an amazing talent. It happens frequently. From in my youth, it was Eddie Murphy who got on SNL, I think when he was like 19 and he was already an accomplished standup and he was a brilliant sketch performer. Another one about a decade later was Chris Farley who came straight out of the second city in his early twenties straight on to Saturday Night Live, straight into movies. And everybody looks at those people and they're like, oh my God, so talented. They're masters. You know, how did they do it? Well, they did it from a young age and they loved it. And they mm. got that that fake confidence of validation from friends and family. And they because they loved it, they were passionate about it. They were obsessed with it. They put in their 10,000 hours. So by the time they were 19, they were masters who'd already been doing it for twice the amount of time that Malcolm Gladwell says you need to do it in order to become a master of the craft. Mm. And at some point, probably in their first five to 10 years, they actually started to get that neutral feedback and they're dealing with more critical audiences. Let's say the other kids at school, you know, uh, siblings or kids in the neighborhood, you know, you name it. And for Eddie Murphy, it was actually going to clubs. And that's when the real skill development starts to happen, when you start to cater to the audience and adjust mm-hmm. what you do. So you're still having fun. You're still doing what you love. But it's it, you've got that Venn diagram where what you love and what the audience likes meets in the middle. Mm-hmm. And then you're really going to soar. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And And I'd love to know, because you've mentioned fun there, and in your book, How to Write Funny, you talk about the clown and the editor. And obviously, people can read the book to read about it in more detail. But I think it would be an interesting concept to introduce here in terms of how we really balance those two things, because you describe the fun and that keeps us going, but also when we don't want that um, sort of false feedback, we actually do need to be able to give ourselves clear feedback and get it from others. Any ways of kind of negotiating that? Because I, I think I've been through quite the curves of like, like you say, the, the sort of false confidence at the beginner and then like going far too far into the critic and losing the fun and coming back oh. the other way. <laughs> so any tips? Yeah. So I've been thinking about that concept a lot too lately, which is when you're new at something, you're you're using a sledgehammer, not a scalpel. Um, mm-hmm. So the variance in your quality and your adherence to best practices is wild. You know, you're you're going to be all over one way, and then you're going to be all over the other direction. And it's true for any skill, any life skill, any creative skill. And it's the same with knowing how to use the clown and the editor. And those are kind of, they represent the two opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to creativity. So when we're kids, we're pretty much all clown. 
which is we think everything we do is funny. Mm. We don't edit anything that comes out of our mouths. We just say whatever. And we're having fun. So that's the clown. It's like pure creative energy. Now, if you don't employ any editor and you're just clown, you're going to be kind of insufferable to people. You're, you're going to be one of these always on people. Mm. And a lot of what you do isn't going to be funny because it's not practiced or, or perfected in any way. It's just like running your mouth off or whatever. And the, the editor is um, the opposite end of the spectrum where you're going to be overly critical. And this is where most adults are. They're purely in the editor side of their brain, super critical, basically edit and cut everything before they even say it. So they're mm -hmm. not producing any comedy. They're not writing any comedy articles. They're not performing because they just, they lock it out and say, oh, nothing I do will be funny. Um, and people who have writer's block are stuck in editor brain because nothing they write is good. So they don't write. They're afraid of looking at bad writing on the page. And so when you're not practiced at doing anything creative, you're going to possibly move wildly between those two extremes, just blunder through and like, ah, you know, I'm feeling really on now. I'm feeling really motivated. I'm with my friends. I'm having fun. I'm really funny. Why am I not funny when I'm trying to write? I'm all editor. It's because you're not practiced at it and you haven't been doing it for 10,000 hours. Mm -hmm. And so you're just, you're a bull in a China shop. So the masterful creators are people who who employ the two strengths of those extremes the clown and the editor with precision mm. and they're not bouncing all the way across the road of life zooming into oncoming traffic zooming into the shoulder they're mm. right in their lane and mm. they dip into clown brain when they need to generate a rough draft they dip into editor brain when they need to refine that rough draft when they need to get some feedback and, and incorporate it. It's all these sorts of very subtle, nuanced moves where you're just kind of going like this and this and this between clown and editor. Like the feedback process in particular is, is a lot. So mm. when you make yourself open to feedback and you listen to it, you're pretty much all in editor if it's good, neutral feedback. I'm not talking about the kind of positive feedback you get from grandma. That mm. doesn't count you're going to be in pure editorial mode, editor brain. But when you implement that feedback, you're going to have to dip back into clown brain because someone may have introduced a problem that you need to fix, but they didn't necessarily know the solution. Now you have to find the solution. So you're going to brainstorm. You're going to come up with a bunch of different ideas. Then you're going to self-assess. You're going to dip back into editor brain and decide of these five or six, this one I think is the funniest, going to go with that one. Uh, and that that's a skill you see in the in the pros that ability mm -hmm. to use those two extremes with nuance yeah that makes a lot of sense and i have a follow on from that which is that um so you're someone who um has probably received lots of feedback and also had to give lots of feedback in multiple contexts in the different rooms that you've been in and the projects that you've run any advice for someone because in in the book when you're talking about the editor you talk about um that if not if you're not careful it can also like um you need to like keep your instincts so that it's not just bringing in the doubt and the judgment any tips for like being really receptive to feedback and being a pro but like really honing those instincts too and I'm asking with self-interest because that's also something yeah. that I feel like I've been through different waves of with trying to be completely open to feedback and going too far that way and um, trying to then be like no this is my vision so calibrating that and honing yeah. instincts yeah it's the same thing it's it's all about finding that balance and the best way to find it is through experience yeah. This is why, like, depending on what kind of comedy you're doing, let's say you're writing short comedy articles, mm. the more you do and the more you go through that process, and I'm talking about the complete process, coming up with an idea, drafting it, getting feedback, refining it, finishing it, publishing it, getting feedback from editors and actual readers, then going back to step one and doing it again. If you did that once a week for a year, you would be in pretty good shape for 
having all the skills that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You would know when feedback is good. You'd know when it's bad. You'd know when to listen to it, when to not. You'd know when to listen to yourself as opposed to the feedback. And you'd have a better idea of knowing how to fix base, you know, certain mistakes or errors or problems that any feedback points out. And you'd have a really solid sense of your own internal judgment versus that of other people. Mm. And it's really nice to be in that position because sometimes, you know, every piece is different. Mm. I'll stay in this example of uh, short comedy articles. Sometimes you write a short piece and you feel like, yeah, it's pretty good, but I don't know, it's just not really feeling it, something's not right or whatever. I'm going to get feedback on a piece like that and it's going to be more enlightening. It's going to be like, oh, okay, I see. I see what it could be. The feedback is really helping me. Other pieces you'll write will really feel like, oh my God, this is a, this is a winner. I really know this works. Um, so the feedback you get on that one is going to be a little bit more like, ah, they're wrong. You know, mm -hmm. I, know I know what I've got going here. Or, or these three people are wrong, but this one person who has an idea for amping it up, you know, one degree, that's the one I'm taking, you know, I'm going to use, they get what I'm doing and I'm just going to implement their feedback, you know, does that make sense? It does. And how do you think that, about that when you're writing your novels, um, if it's any different? Yeah, it's very similar. Yeah. It's just bigger. <laughs> so, okay. I guess, again, self-interest that it's um, yeah, yeah. that thing because like there's the bigger vision and sometimes it's not realized when you're trying to describe to someone how act one works or you're trying to send a chapter in isolation. So again, it's calibrating it for those like bigger scale projects right. where it's not really yeah. fully there for feedback yet. I would never send a chapter out for isolated editing. Yeah. I, the way I would do and the way I do do a novel typically is I write an outline and I might write an outline after I do a first draft. Mm -hmm. But it should be, and when I say outline, that kind of means a treatment, like mm -hmm. a two to three page treatment that has the whole story. And I'll get feedback on that right. because that's really easy for people to digest mm -hmm. and it's really easy for them to get it, the whole overarching point of the book. And once I get that feedback, then I'm going to refine my draft or write my draft. And then I'm going to have beta readers read that entire draft. Mm -hmm. uh, but I won't send them the rough draft. Mm. I basically always send beta readers a, a second draft, but in their minds and what I call it is a first draft. Mm. So I kind of use the terms rough draft and first draft. So rough draft is just like pour it all out there. There's no structure. Things change as you figure things out and they're not fixed. I would never show that to anybody. It's a mess mm. with one exception, which I can, I can get to later. But then I'll refine that so it's digestible to another person. And mm. that's called the first draft. And that I would send to beta readers for them to read and in its entirety and tell me what they thought of it. Very helpful step, like incredibly valuable step. And I ask specific questions of readers. I have a form that they fill out mm. and I'll see if I can remember everything on the form. It's something like, give me your overall impression of the book in 500 words or less. Tell me five things about the book that you thought didn't work and then give me suggestions for how to fix each one, like 250 mm. words each. Um, those are the main things I'm looking for. Mm. I don't necessarily want to know what was good about the book because you'll just get a bunch of pablum, like, I thought the characters were really good. Like that's not going to help you at all. Mm. That'll be covered in the overall. Tell me overall what you thought. What I'm really interested in is what's not working and how can I fix it? Because what will happen is, and I usually get 20 to 50 beta readers to read a, a book. Wow. Okay. And I'll get, and I send them out to my list, you know, and my list is, I'm so fortunate to have this email list of people who have bought my books or signed up for my courses or whatever, because a lot of them are professional writers, professional comedy writers. And I qualify them before I send out a book to beta readers. Mm. I say, okay, who wants to beta read my book? Uh, tell me why you'd make a great beta reader. And I'll mm. get like two or 300 responses saying, I'd love to read the book, love to be a beta reader for you. I'm a literature professor at Brown University. And so I think, mm. perfect, I'll accept. You'll mm. be a great beta reader. 
another person will be like, you know, I don't really have any experience, but I love books. They might not make the cut, you know. Hmm. So, but I might also grab a couple of people who seem counterintuitive and throw them in the mix. Mm -hmm. So I get a lot of varying opinions and I want varying like political perspectives, different age groups. Um, I had like a 12 year old in one of my beta reading groups recently mm -hmm. and, you know, like a 90 year old. So basically when I get their answers back to my form questions, typically some of the same areas of the book will get mentioned as problem area. So right away, I know that area needs work, that area needs to get fixed. And it'll open my eyes to some things I may not have considered that aren't working, uh, depending on what they say. And the second draft that comes after I get all that feedback is basically my final draft. Mm. Uh, it's with the exception of like minor line edits, copy edits, stuff like that. Um, the, the beta reading step is really, really valuable for me. Mm. It's it's akin to, if I had to make a comparison, it's akin to a comedian going out and trying new material at clubs and learning which lines get laughs and which ones don't and mm -hmm. coming up with an hour of great material. Yeah, there's so many helpful things in there. I think it's a genius idea as well to actually get feedback on the outline and do that in a written form. Um, because again, I've yeah, definitely you gotta got to know you're on off on the right foot. Yeah, you know? but I've, I've tried to do that um, verbally, and it's helpful. But as happens in conversation, then people come in with questions before you've even done it. So actually, I think that's a smart idea, like you say, to know you're off on the right foot and have that clarity. Uh, yeah, and I then do to see verbal, the whole shape. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I do verbal outlines or treatments for movies. Okay. Yeah. Because then you're like telling somebody the story. Yeah. And if they interrupt you and ask questions, that means there's a problem with the outline because they shouldn't mm, have any okay. questions. They should be enraptured. They should be mm. dying to know what's going to happen next and just sit back and listen. Okay. And that's how you know it's working when they're like, oh my God, that's such a great story, you know, mm, is what yeah. you're looking for. Okay. I love it. Loads to think about there. Thank you. Um, so many helpful things already. And you um, mentioned like a comedian being able to go out and test and get laughs. And I love your books that they really help with what's on the page because sometimes I feel like, like there's less help for comedy writers who are trying to get things to be funny on the page. What do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions that people have specifically for that? And I know it's a broad question because it, it could be articles, it could be books, but what are some of the big misconceptions you see? No, that's okay. So I, I first, I want to go back to, I said there was one exception for mm. oh, um, yeah. showing the rough draft to people. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Thank you for remembering. So I started this Substack newsletter where I post mm. a daily creativity tip or motivation or thought. And every part of the effort of this newsletter is that every week I post all the things that I've worked on that week as a, an accountability exercise. So I tell people what my goals are. And then at the end of the week, I show up with receipts and I post all the work. So I'll post all my terrible drafts that haven't even been re-looked at by me, mm -hmm. just because that I'm accountable to that. I'm showing up and saying, I did this, here's the work. Mm -hmm. Only exception. I'm not looking for feedback from that. You know, yeah. Occasionally somebody will see it and say, oh, I like this part, but I don't really count that as anything other than, you know, good job, Scott, keep going. It's mm -hmm. not like critical feedback that's actionable. Anyway, so back to your question about um, the focus on writing and the written word in my books versus stand up. So the reason I focused on the written word in the how to write funny books is because that's the hardest medium to do comedy in. Mm. And I know that if you can get good at that, the others will be easy by comparison. So a lot of stand-ups get my books and it helps them develop jokes for their stand-up act and they find that really easy. The reason writing is so much more difficult than stand-up mm -hmm. is, well, there's many reasons, but the main one is that you don't have any idea of the context of your audience. Mm -hmm. When you're at a stand-up club, you can see them, you can feel the vibe in the room. And that's to say nothing of the benefits of getting that live instant feedback, which you also don't get in writing. So, you know, we talked earlier about the idea of a comedy writing process that's reliable and repeatable. 
you have to have that for written comedy. Otherwise, you're just flailing. <laughs> How are you possibly going to hope to produce any comedy and put it out there and have it work if you don't have a system? Because you have no idea. What, is the audience reading you uh, on a bus while there's a lot of noise going on? Are they in a bad mood? Are they in a mm -hmm. good mood? Are they listening to the audio version of whatever, let's say your comic novel or whatever, or are they reading it? Are they um, a, a sophisticated comedy audience or are they like a, a regular blow, Joe Blow, who likes, you know, fall, people falling down type of humor? Mm. Knowing all those parameters is impossible when you're writing. You literally have no idea. You also, another thing, you don't have is you don't have control over the timing. Mm -hmm. And we all know that timing is super important in comedy. I think it's less important than people always used to think it is, but it has its place, you know, as a tool, you have zero control over timing in written comedy. The only thing you can do is possibly control the amount of time it takes them to get from a headline to a a first line, mm -hmm. you can possibly like, you know, structure your paragraphs and your joke beats. So the jokes come at a good interval, but that's the best you can do. You know, so all the best practices for how to do that are, are in my books. And, you know, the, the best thing you can do is you paint with a broad brush. And that's why I go into the 11 funny filters, because if mm -hmm. you can, if you can nail uh, a humor piece, let's say, with all 11 funny filters in play, there's almost nobody you're not going to reach, you know, mm. they, yeah. because everybody has a different sense of humor. Everybody likes different types of humor. The falling down humor guy is going to like your madcap humor. The intellectual is going to like your meta humor or your wordplay or whatever. So you need that uh, variety and that mix. And yeah. okay, so there's one other thing you asked for, like some basic things that people might want to understand about the the how to write funny books. Um, if a if a stand up is using the how to write funny books to come up with stand up jokes, they're they're going to have access to the same tools that somebody who's writing is using, and they're going to have this, they're going to have the same benefit. Uh, what, what the writer needs to understand is they don't have that context of the standup being at a club, mm. being in a, a club that's called a comedy club where people go to see comedy. So the audience mm. is sitting there waiting and ready for comedy. The writer has to do all that work. They have mm. to introduce that concept because they don't know where their reader is. They don't know where their coming from. They don't know where they're going to see their work. So one of the biggest misconceptions people have, and I see this a lot, is they don't write a funny title for their piece. Hmm. They, It's either like a, a boring title or an informational title, and it goes right from title to a thick block of gray copy. Hmm. And so what they don't realize is that they've, they've failed in the very first job of the prose comedy writer, which is to introduce the concept that, hey, this will be a funny article. Mm. So make it a funny title so people will see it and say, oh, that's kind of funny. And it will make them want to read further. And then hopefully they're in good hands with you and you take them through this well-paced process of escalating joke beats that get funnier and funnier. And that's that's perfect. And um so I I love that you like really bring this home because as as you say like in the clubs uh, like how we have to announce it we just we can't also lean on that social contract uh, that you right. put in the books as well and the kind of fake laughter or the group laughter like it's it's a hard sell <laughs> so yeah, yeah actually we really I just thought of something that might be fun somebody yeah. should uh, write an article someday and point out this problem and provide an audio file with the article that people are supposed to play that's mm. like a laugh track that's <laughs> timed for when they think the jokes <laughs> are in their article. So as soon as uh, you start reading, hit play, yeah, yeah. and then it'll work for you. 
Oh, that's brilliant. Love it. Um, And I will say the funny filters are absolute genius that you have to, if you're interested in writing comedy, creating comedy in any way, they will absolutely help you because um, they do just that break it down in a way that I haven't seen before. And and I managed to find books that helped me with kind of story and development of different characters, but those filters are so helpful. So I'm not going to pull them all out. Um, Because people can can read the book. So I just wanted to pull out one because you've then extrapolated it out into a a whole book, which is the characters. Yeah. Again, that's worth um, buying two in itself because the uh, list of types is absolute genius. Um, All the work on traits is amazing. So I'm not going to ask you to repeat your book, but I would just love to know, like on a personal level, when you're writing yourself, are there any types that you really love to write or when you're viewing are there any because as I was reading them when I saw them I was like oh you mentioned like the weirdo like Aubrey Plaza and like the animal that Kreischer and I was like oh yeah they're two of my absolute favorites as a viewer and also a writer so I was just curious for yourself if you have any you might not because you've written for so many I do. things yeah my favorite character by far and I say that because it's the one I always seem to come back to is the bumbling authority I think it's the funniest oh, okay. character yeah. And I've always liked it. Like growing up, I liked Leslie Nielsen's character in the uh, Police Squad show and the Naked Gun yeah. movies and in Airplane where he's like a doctor. He's a detective. He's an authority. He's a low-level authority, and, but he's bumbling. He's a total idiot. And mm-hmm. I just always thought that was funny. Ted Knight from the Mary Tyler Moore show. And so The Onion is that character. The Onion is supposed yeah. to be this important newspaper. So it's like an authority, but everything it says is silly. So it's a bumbling authority. And it was so much fun casting The Onion's newsman for The Onion Radio News Show. Yeah. Uh, we got really lucky with um, P.S. Mueller, who was a local cartoonist in Madison, Wisconsin, who did these wonderful little cartoons for alternative weeklies. They look like scribbles and people might've heard his name or seen him around. His cartoons would be in the New Yorker once in a while and psychology today ran them quite a bit. So he understood humor on like a really expert level, but he had the most perfect AM radio news voice because he used to do AM radio news uh, when he was younger and he just, and he smoked a lot. He had this deep, rich voice and it just sounded like the voice of authority. And so that was such a joyous project. He worked on our first audiobook. Actually, did he do both? I can't remember if he, yeah, he did um, both of our um, first audiobooks for Ardem Century and for The Onion's Finest News Reporting, which was a collection, our first collection. And just he automatically made everything in the onion a hundred times funnier because he was the embodiment of the bumbling authority character. Mm. Yeah, that's lovely and lovely insight to think of uh, the onion being this character too, which clearly it is, but that's a really, really fun way to think of it. Love it. So just two more questions before we wrap up. One is because you are such a renowned expert in this field, satire, I just wondered if there's any things, and obviously like satire can change uh, as times move, or maybe you think it doesn't, but I'd love to know what's catching your attention currently or in the past couple of years when it comes to people who are successfully employing satire uh, in comedy, but any media of your choice. Yeah. I'm going to give you my pessimistic answer and my okay. optimistic answer. So Go for it. I'll do the pessimistic first. Okay. Uh, I feel like human beings are just a terrible species of animal. We're just oh. mean <laughs> and we're dumb and we're stuck in our old evolutionary patterns. We can't solve big problems. We're violent, you know, like what's going on in the Middle East right now is just heartbreaking that, um, you know, one group of people attacks, murders, rapes, takes hostages, and the other side responds by murdering, um, you know, tens of thousands of people. It's like nobody wins. And that's human beings for you. You know, there's no real wise leaders who can step in and say, actually, this violence is not solving any problem. Um, And much of what satire does is points out things like that, the foibles of humanity. We're, We're doomed to be dumb, violent apes who 
like, you know, you look at the world and it's like, who's in charge? Like who, where are the adults? <laughs> we're just like yeah. ruining the planet. We're killing each other. We're not getting any better. The, the, yes, there's some cool inventions, but like, where's the utopia that we were promised by BF Skinner back in the day? Where's the utopia that we always see in the science fiction movies where they're living in perfect harmony with nature and they have this self-sustaining world, like impossible. It's never going to happen. We're, we're just idiots. Mm -hmm. And satire can point that out and we can all laugh at it, but it's kind of a hollow, sad laugh because we know it's never going to change. There's mm -hmm. nothing we can do. The optimistic side. <laughs> the <laughs> okay. optimistic side is um, occasionally I feel like satire at its best does improve people's critical thinking skills. And it, uh, mm -hmm. it opens their minds a little bit to a d another way of looking at things. And it can, it can change over the long term. So the popularity of satire in the past 25 years is like nothing we've ever seen in human history. There has mm -hmm. been satire before, but it's been more of a niche thing or it's been like one author, like somebody like Mark Twain, you know, but it was such a huge part of like American culture and I guess English speaking culture and other cultures as well over the past 25 years that I think it actually improved the, the positive cynicism and the critical thinking skills of the younger generation, generation that came up during that time. So partly the millennials, partly Gen Z, and certainly Gen Alpha, who are the most progressive generation we've seen ever. Thank you, um, Scott, for such a thoughtful and uh, well, thought-provoking answer that I think is perfect for writers who are engaged in comedy that want to do so at a really deep and human level. So many generous things you shared today. I highly recommend your books. Where should people oh. go to find out more about you and your work? Uh, the best place to go to find out more about me is howtowritefunny.com. And uh, the Google is always your best friend because yeah. I'm on all the social media. And um, I have my daily Substack list, which I think might show up in Google. But you can yep. look for me on Substack as well. And feel free to spell my name wrong because I'll, I'll still show up. <laughs> ideal, ideal for the internet. And honestly, I'll put all those links in the show notes. So thank you so much for your time today, Scott. I've been Absolutely. fascinated listening to you. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me.